Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Armand, another exciting lab lecture uh, for you. Today, we're going to be talking about the spectral photometric determination of food dyes. So, turn on how much concentration of food dyes, of particular food dyes, are in solution. Today, in the spirit of spring, I'm wearing a nice lime green shirt, kind of be festive. Green's always a good color to wear to lighten up the area. So today I'm wearing a lime green shirt for you. And so we're going to give a brief overview of the experiment. Now this actually, y'all will be happy, actually correlates more to the virtual lab you'll be doing as well. So sit back, relax, and let the chemistry flow. Okay. So like I said earlier, experiment nine deals with, or did deal with, or deals with, I guess is the term, the spectrophotometric determination of dyes. And so what are dyes? Well, dyes are colored compounds. And the unique thing about colored compounds is that they absorb energy in the visible region. So anything that's a colored compound absorbs energy in the visible region. So we're talking about the visible region here. And the visible region is anywhere from 400 to about, you know, very edge 700 nanometers. And so the 400 nanometer range is more of your violet uh, blue light. The 700 nanometer range is more of your red light. And so as you remember, shorter wavelength equals greater energy. So the shorter the wavelength, the more energy or the greater the energy of the photon that's being absorbed. And the, 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 the color that is absorbed by the compound is actually dependent on the nature of the compound. So it depends on the chemical structure of the compound to determine whether something's going to absorb light in the visible region or not. So for example, uh, what something appears is going to absorb light in the opposite region. So if something appears blue, like if you look at a, a solution of copper 2 plus and it appears blue, it means it absorbs light in the opposite region. So it absorbs light from 580 to 600 which is like the green, yellow, green uh, region. So this would be absorbing yellow, green light. So it appears blue, but absorbs yellow, green light. Now if something appears red, such as in tomatoes, the lycopene, it absorbs light around 490. So 490 is like a blue light. So it's going to absorb blue light. So again, what it appears is going to absorb in the opposite region. So yellow green light is absorbed for something that appears blue. Now, in particular, there are many different types of compounds that can absorb in the visible region. We're going to look at a few natural products or natural compounds that are in nature that absorb in the visible region. And so here we have something, for example, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They both are colored compounds that absorb in the excuse me, visible region. Lycopene which is the, uh, one of the uh, compounds found in tomatoes that give it its red color. So it appears red, but it's going to absorb in the opposite region. So lycopene would absorb light around blue light, so around the 490 nanometers. Cartonoids are very colored compounds. There's a whole list of them. The most common one probably you know is beta carotene, which is found in carrots. Gives it its orange color, so again, it appears orange, so it's going to absorb in the opposite region 
of the uh, visible region. Lutein is something that is not as common, but if you know you do come across it sometimes more often than others, but beta carotene is probably the most common uh, carotenoid. Now, all of these structures, chlorophyll, lycopene, carotenoids, what they all have in common is they have numerous double bonds. So all these compounds And that's what gives it its absorption in the visible region is when you have, typically when you have a compound that has lots of double bonds, it's going to be a colored compound, very what we call conjugated system. And so all of these uh, compounds, they all have in common is numerous double bonds throughout the structure. Now, what do we use to measure the concentration or to measure how much light is absorbed or reflected? It's called a spectro spectrophotometer. And that's what we use to determine how much light is absorbed by a colored compound. And so the spectrophotometer has a few uh, unique parts. So first of all, we need a light source. And so a light source could be white light. Then what we need is something very important. Then what we need is a monochromator. And a monochromator helps us identify the particular wavelength of light that we want to measure at. So for example, we want yellow light. We would set the wavelength to yellow light so that the monochromator only allows yellow light to pass through. So the monochromator is used to help separate all the light into the particular wavelength we want. So mono meaning one, chromator meaning light. And so then it passes through the cuvette. As it passes through the cuvette, for example, this yellow light gets absorbed by the sample and less yellow light goes through to the detector. And so the detector measures the difference in intensity of the light. So you start with 100%, you go through, so here I naught, let's say is 100%, you go through the what's called the cuvette, which has your solution of colored compound. The molecules in the solution are going to absorb some of that depending on many factors such as concentration, and we'll get into those in just a second. As it absorbs light, less light passes through to the detector, so we have our final intensity. So the difference, the ratio between those two intensities is where we get one type of readout, which is called percent transmittance. So percent transmittance is the ratio between the incoming light and the outgoing light. Because again, the molecules in the compound um, absorb some of the light. And such factors like concentration play a role in how much light is absorbed. Now, another thing that's, another type of measurement that's useful in Spectro in spectrophotometers is absorbance. So absorbance you can calculate by using this equation with the percent transmittance. But nowadays, in most uh, spectrometers, you can get the readout of absorbance from the display. This is the equation of how you would calculate absorbance from percent transmittance. And so a spectrometer or a spectrophotometer is how you would, what you would use to measure the absorbance of samples that absorb color in the visible region. So if we were to scan the entire visible region with our spect spectrometer or spectrophotometer, we would see that in certain places in the vis in the visible spectrum, we would have maximum absorbance. So that means that that particular wavelength, a lot of the light gets absorbed by the solution. And that particular wavelength where a lot of the uh, light is absorbed is called lambda max. And so every compound has its own unique 
Lambda Max. And the lambda max is dependent on such things as the molecular structure, which if you take upper level chemistry classes, you would talk more about this, especially in a uh, spectrometry, spectrometry, uh, spectrometry class. And so, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about that, you could take that uh, class or later on in your chemistry clearing. But the main thing is to note is that different types of compounds absorb have maximum absorbance at different um, wavelengths. So for example, blue food coloring and green food coloring have a lambda max around 650. So blue food coloring and green food coloring, lambda max approximately 650 because again it appears blue and green is going to absorb in the opposite region. Next we look at we have red food coloring and red food coloring has a lambda max of about you know roughly 530 and this is just an approximation. So red food coloring Lambda max around 530. Of course, these are in nanometers. And then lastly, we look at yellow food coloring, which is right about here. It's approximately, you know, uh, I would say 400 and 30 nanometers. Again, these are approximations. So for yellow food coloring, lambda max is approximately, you know, around 430 nanometers. So again, it's going to absorb in the blue region, but it appears yellow. And so the factors that affect, one of the factors that affects how much light as absorbed is how many molecules are present. So the more molecules you have present, the more light is going to absorb. So if you want to get higher absorbance, you want higher concentration because higher absorbance is directly linked to higher concentration samples. So that's one way you can increase the absorbance is by increasing the concentration. And so every compound has a particular lambda max for it. So there's one point on the visible spectrum where it absorbs the most energy. Now be careful when you're doing the lab, the, uh, excuse me, the uh, virtual lab, because you'll need to record the lambda maxes. So what you'll do is you'll scan the entire wavelength of the visible spectrum to see where the lambda max is for your particular compounds. And every compound has a different lambda max. What we're over here to the right side is to show you that if we plot percent transmittance versus wavelength, anywhere there's a strong absorbance, there's very little transmittance. So it's kind of like the opposite of absorbance. Absorbance, you have peaks. Where there's low transmittance, you have valleys. And this is a pretty useful technique to use in chemistry. So one of the laws that describes the relationship between absorbance and concentration is called the Beer-Lambert law, or commonly referred to as Beer's law. And it's based on the relationship that the higher the concentration of a colored compound will absorb more at lambda max than a dilute solution of the same compound. So if you increase the concentration, you're going to increase its absorbance. And 
what we do is typically we do Beer's Law for dilute solutions. And Beer's Law works the best if the absorbance is under one. We'll talk more about this in a little bit, but if your absorbance of your solution is greater than one, above one absorbance, Beer's Law starts to deviate from linearity. So you always want to make sure that when you're doing, uh, doing an experiment using Beer's Law, that your absorbance of your solution is less than one. And we'll talk about in a second how you can do that by doing dilutions. And so what affects how much light is absorbed or how much radiation is absorbed is are three things. We talked about one, the nature of the compound, so the molecular structure of the compound. We mentioned the concentration of the sample. And then another one is the length of path of light. And this is based on the width of the cuvette. And so this is something that really can't be changed unless you change the type of cuvette. And so the length of path of light is typically one centimeter because cuvettes are usually one centimeter What? And again, based on the type of spectrometer you use, it's very, it might be a little bit difficult to change the path length of your cuvette. So generally they're at one centimeter. So again, nature of the compound, concentration of the sample, length of path of the light affect how much radiation is absorbed. So Beer's Lambert the Beer's Lambert law is out is absorbance equals epsilon times b times c. Now C is the concentration of the sample, and generally the concentration of the sample is in molarity. But it can be different, but generally the concentration of the sample is in units of molarity. B is the path length of the, uh, the cell or the cuvette, and this is generally, usually in centimeters, the most common uh, path length is one centimeter. Now, epsilon is a little bit different. Epsilon is called the molar absorptivity. And this varies with the compound. So different compounds give different molar absorptivities uh, for it. And so since it varies with compound, it, this particular property it deals with the molecular or the makeup of the molecule because different compounds give different molar absorptivities. And just to give you a brief introduction of where the molar absorptivity comes from, it comes from the type of electronic transition that the electrons undergo in the molecule. And so there are many different types of electronic transitions. And if you have the, if you take, for example, organic two, later on in your career, you'll learn more about these electronic transmissions. But these are orbitals. These are called molecular orbitals, which are somewhat similar to the atomic orbitals you learn or are learning right now. So electrons jump from one type of molecular orbital to another. And depending on what molecular orbital it starts at and it ends at, will determine the type of molar absorptivity. So for example, pi to pi star gives you a very high molar absorptivity of 1,000 to 10,000. But n to pi star is not as high for the molar absorptivity, 10 to 100. And then n to sigma star, 100 to 3,000. Again, this is based on the makeup of the compound, what type of transition occurs. And you'll learn more about this in organic chemistry.
So what do we do with Beer Lambert's Law? Well, the, the main thing we do with Beer Lambert's Law is to get a graph that shows us the relationship between the absorbance of a compound and concentration. And this should be a linear graph. So you plot absorbance versus concentration. When you plot the absorbance versus concentration, you're going to get a linear fit. So there should be a linear direct relationship between absorbance and concentration. As you increase the concentration, you increase the absorbance. And from the linear equation, you can get the slope and find the molar absorptivity of the compound. Now the reason we don't plot percent transmittance versus concentration is because it's a non-linear plot. So we don't we can't use transmittance versus concentration because again it's non-linear. We use absorbance versus concentration. So what you would do is you would take a series of known concentrations, determine their absorbance, plot their data, do linear regression, and then take your unknown sample, determine the absorbance, and calculate the x, the wavelength. And so the way we make these, talk solu these solutions of known concentration is by using what's called a volumetric flask. And on a, a volumetric flask, you have these calibration marks on the glassware. So when you fill the water up to that particular mark, that tells you you contain that amount of volume in the flask. And again, volumetric flasks are used to make your dilute solutions of known concentrations. So for Beer's Law to work, you have to have a series of known concentrations that you determine the absorbance for to generate your graph. And so the most common glassware used is volumetric flask. And we'll talk about how you make these dilute solutions from a more concentrated solution. And so the way we prepare standards, there's many different ways to prepare standards, but one way of preparing standards is by doing a serial dilution. So you start with your more concentrated solution. You measure the absorbance of that. You take, say, one milliliter of the concentrated solution. So this is our concentrated solution right here. We take one milliliter of the concentrated solution, in this case, the 100 molar a solution. We add it to a 10 mil volumetric flask, and then we fill it to the mark with water, in this case, nine milliliters. So now we're one tenth the original concentration. So now we're at 10 molar. Then we take one milliliter of the 10 molar solution, add it to a 10 mil volumetric flask, fill it with water. Now we're at one tenth the previous concentration. So we're at one molar. And then at each one of these, you would measure the absorbance of. Then we would take one milliliter of the one molar solution, add it to another 10 milliliter volumetric flask, fill it with water, and then we have a 0.1 molar solution. Once we have the 0.1 molar solution, we measure its absorbance, then we take one milliliter of that, put it in another 10 milliliter volumetric flask, add water to the mark, and now we have a 0.01 solution. So serial dilution is a very good technique to get to make small solutions of, of small concentration from a large concentration. Because if you were to make a 0.01 molar solution, from a 100 molar sample, you would need a very small amount of a solution. So let's see.
Checking my work before. You need like one thousandth of a millet. Oh, no, excuse me, one tenth of a millet. So that's why we use cereal dilution to the so that we don't need so little amounts of solution to make the more dilute solution. So let's look at a few examples involving these. So here we want to prepare 50 milliliters of a 50%, 25%, 12.5%, and a 6.25% solution using only 50 milliliters of 100% solution. So, so we want to prepare the 50% solution. We're going to use that famous equation, M1V1. Well, let me do that. M1V1 equals M2V2, or MCVC equals MDVD. Same thing, dilute or one or two. So we're going to start with our 100% solution here. We want to know how much of the 100% solution we need to make a 50 milliliters of a 50% solution. So we come here, we see that if we work this out, we need 25 milliliters of the 100%. So this is of the 100% solution. So what you would do is you would add 25 milliliters of the 100% solution, maybe using a burette to a 50 mil volumetric flask, fill it to the calibration mark, now you have your 50% uh, solution. So now if we take the 50% solution and we want to prepare a 25% solution. So we're doing a serial dilution. So again, we're starting with the 50% solution we made in the previous step. We want to know how much concentration of it we need to prepare 50 milliliters of a 25% solution. So we solve for VC, we get 25 milliliters. So this is of the 50%. So we add 25 milliliters of the 50% solution to a 50 mil volumetric flask, fill it to the mark. So the other Amount of volume is with DI water, you shake it, you have your 25% solution. Now we want to prepare a 12.5% solution. So now what we do is we're going to take the 50% solution, that's our concentrated solution. We want to know how much of the 50% solution we need to again make 50 milliliters of a 12.5% solution. So we work this out, we get that we need 12.5 milliliters of the 50% solution. So you would use a burette to measure out the 12.5 milliliters and a fit for, of the 50% solution and add it to a 50 mil volumetric flask. And then the rest of the volume is filled with DI water. So you just fill it to the mark with DI water. And so now we have our 12.5% solution. Next we want to make the 6.25% solution. And let's say we're going to start with a, oh that's a typo. I know it's not a typo. We want to start with a 60% solution. So we want to prepare a 6.25% solution from a 60% solution. So we're starting with a 60% solution. We want to know how much 
of the 60% solution we need to make a 6.25% solution. So again, our concentrated solution is 60 VC we want to determine, and we want to make 50 milliliters of a 6.25% solution. So again, we solve for how much of the concentrated solution we need. So we need 5.21 milliliters of a 60% solution. So you would add this 5.21 milliliters of the 12 point, oh, this is, that's a typo, let me see. Let me double check my work here. Got a lot of typos. Oh, okay, so this shouldn't be 12.25, this is actually a typo. This should be of the 60%. So we're gonna add 5.21 milliliters of the 60% to a 50 mil volumetric flask and fill the rest of it of water. So technically there's 5.21 milliliters of 60% solution and 44.79 milliliters of the uh, water. That's what makes up the solution. And when you mix it, you have your 6.25% solution. Again, serial dilution is important because that's how you prepare your standard solutions to use to determine the absorbance of each one of them to make your Beer's Law plot. You plot absorbance versus concentration. So the end. So hope today was a, or this lecture was a beneficial to you. Again, this lecture kind of correlates more to the virtual lab you'll be doing because in the virtual lab you'll be using Beer's Law. You'll be making, uh, I think they already have the standard solutions prepared. You'll be determining the absorbance of those. And then you'll be given an unknown sample. And so also after watching this video, make sure you complete the Experiment 9 lab lecture quiz. It's posted in Blackboard, so don't forget to do that. And remember today I'm wearing a festive green color shirt. You might see that question on the lab lecture quiz. So until next time, I'll see you later.